All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight, presented by FanDuel here at The Volume. Happy Monday, everybody. Again, for those of you who watched the Rui Hachimura to the Lakers trade breakdown that we did earlier today, if you have not seen that yet, you can find that on our YouTube feed. Today, we're breaking down three games, and I've got two quick hitters for you. So the Los Angeles Clippers went into Dallas and beat the Mavericks with a really impressive fourth quarter. Going to dive into that game a little bit. Then the Golden State Warriors blew a 13-point fourth quarter lead to the Brooklyn Nets. Another masterpiece performance from Kyrie Irving. Going to spend some time on Kyrie and Nick Claxton today. And then lastly, the Lakers went into Portland, fell down 25 at the half, and came back to win convincingly. Good time to be a Lakers fan. They just made that trade for Rui Hachimura, like we mentioned earlier. Good times. Anthony Davis coming back next week as well. Starting to see a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel there. My quick hitters for today, I have some thoughts on the NBA's luxury tax and how I believe it is unfair and punishes successful teams. And then the Philadelphia 76ers won five consecutive road games. Gonna, uh, th- They're doing a good job of making me look right with one of my big New Year's predictions. So uh, a lot of basketball to get into today. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to the Volumes YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore Jason LT so you guys don't miss any show announcements. And then last but not least, if for whatever reason you guys miss one of these videos and you can't get back over to YouTube to finish, you can find them wherever you get your podcasts under hoops tonight. So Clippers Mavs. Back and forth game, but the Clippers completely dominated the fourth quarter. Paul George got him going early in the fourth by hunting transition opportunities, getting to the foul line. Kawhi Leonard was unbelievable in this game. Got to the rim a couple of times um, in the fourth quarter, but mo- for the most part was starting the rotation, um, getting the Mavericks in rotation by just posting up on that right block, getting the basketball, drawing that double team, and making the easy read out of it so that guys could capitalize on that. A big guy capitalized on on that was Norman Powell, who continues to just be awesome. He had 19 points on 12 shots in this game. Norman's averaging 21 points per game over his last nine games on 52% from the field, 53% from three, and 78% from the line. It's really this simple. He can shoot the shit out of the basketball, and he has a super quick first step and the vertical athleticism to finish in traffic at the rim. He shoots 61% on four attempts in the restricted area every game. For a guard, anything over 60% is excellent. Most of the guards in the league are hovering in the mid-50s. And then out of 68 players who have logged at least 150 spot-up possessions this year, Norman Powell ranks 16th out of 68 at 1.17 point per possession. Absolutely must have guys like that in a driving kick system because Kawhi Leonard and Paul George are going to create that initial advantage, but you need guys to continue to keep the defense in rotation until you get a great shot. And they've got three guys in particular that are really excelling this year. Nick Batum, Marcus Morris, and Norman Powell, who's actually above all of them. But all three of those guys are up over 1.1 points per possession in spot-up situations. A little bit, a little, you know, uh, a glass half full way to look at the Clippers offense this season. Uh, Kawhi Leonard is starting to look very much like Kawhi Leonard. In his last 14 games, he's averaging 25, 6, and 4. 53% from the field, 45% from three, 89% from the line. In his last seven games, 37 and 4. 54% from the field, 53% from three, and 94% from the line. It looks every bit like the old Kawhi, except for like, you know, that just otherworldly contact in traffic wild dunk, like the ones that he had against the Jazz before he got hurt a couple years ago. We, we, we haven't seen that quite yet, but he does have everything else going. He's shooting 47% on pull-up jump shots this year. He's shooting 55% inside of 17 feet on jump shots, 44% on long twos between 17 feet and the three-point line, and in the last couple of months, he's starting to hit his three-point shot as well. I know things don't look great for the Clips. They've lost nine of their last 13, although they have won two in a row. And they're only 7-7 and in Kawhi's last 14 games. But I continue to think that this mostly has to do with the lack of continuity and rhythm as guys have been in and out of the lineup. I think there's a really good chance that the Clippers lock in and finish the season on a high note and have some juice left in the uh, the tank to make a playoff run. I'm not ready to give up on them yet. And then moving over to the Mavs, it was a rough night for Luka. He was getting to his spots frequently against the Clippers in these switches, particularly in the mid to short range, but he was missing the shots, you know, and, and like he was, he was scoring at the rim. He was, yeah, I think he was three for seven on his step back threes, but just three for 11 
on jump shots between the restricted area and the three-point line. That particular shot is so important for him against the Clippers with the way that they defend him, trying to force him to take those step-back twos in the mid-range. He just has to make those shots. The Mavs are 3-7 and seven in their last 10 games, but I do think now that Dorian Finney-Smith is back and now that Josh Green is back, once those guys get back into a rhythm, the defensive end will click up for the Mavs and things should take off from there. I do expect them to settle down once they get healthy, especially when Maxi Kleba comes back, although I think he's still a month or two away. All right, time for our first quick hitter. So Ben Thompson, you guys might know him from Stratechery. He's also a huge Bucks fan. You may have heard him on the Bill Simmons podcast a few times. I met him in Vegas when I went out to Summer League last year. Really nice guy. He tweeted something uh, yesterday that I thought was really interesting. He said, quote, the NBA luxury tax allows mediocre teams to turn a profit every year or turn a profit year after year. Meanwhile, it punishes successful teams, and it's insane to have an incentive to not win be at the core of this league. I 100% agree. For the record, why does the luxury tax exist? It's designed to stop, you know, a Joe Lacob type, or really anybody, from having like a four or five hundred million dollar payroll. That's what it's designed for. But in the process of trying to dissuade, you know, this really strange situation that will almost never happen, all they've done is punish a bunch of other teams that were never even close to having that type of payroll to begin with. The salary cap rules in and of themselves prevent teams from loading up on talent. Like, guess what? The Warriors can't just throw a max contract at James Harden this summer if he decides to opt out and become a free agent. He does like they can't do that. The salary cap prevents them from doing that. If you look at their roster and you look at Steph Curry, who they drafted, Draymond Green, who they drafted, Klay Thompson, who they drafted, Jordan Poole, who they drafted, Jonathan Kaminga, Moses Moody, all these guys, when it comes down to paying all of them, they're going to get squeezed. And yes, Andrew Wiggins is a fallback from a, or a return from the D'Lo trade, which was a return from the Kevin Durant trade. But Kevin Durant signed into cap space. When the Warriors signed KD, they had cap space. Then they flipped that asset for an asset that they then flipped into Andrew Wiggins. The Golden State Warriors are not New York Yankees. They're not pulling a New York Yankees and just buying a basketball team. That's not happening. They're not just writing checks and bringing in superstars. They are drafting good players. And then when they lose a player in free agency, they do the smart thing, which is trade him for something in return so that you have access to money above the cap. The salary cap does not allow you to sign players over the cap unless you use an exception. And the exceptions are veteran minimum contracts, the mid-level exception, which isn't going to get you that good of a player to begin with, or bird rights, things associated with players that you have under your control. You can go over the cap when you have players that are under your control. And I hate that in this system, if you draft well, you get squeezed, and I don't think that that's fair. And, I, and like, I'm really curious to see which exciting young core that we have around the league that's going to end up getting punished by this. Like, are the Grizzlies going to be able to sign Desmond Bain to his rookie extension without having to ship off someone else to avoid luxury tax? Are they going to lose Brandon Clark or Stephen Adams or something like that? Or uh, we look at New Orleans. What about when Herb Jones and Herb Jones and Trey Murphy get to the point where they need to be extended? Are those guys going to get squeezed? Or is somebody else on the roster going to get squeezed for them? Just because those teams drafted well, you know, like David Griffin goes out and gets two really good wings and Herb Jones and Trey Murphy, and it's going to put him in a bind. That's not fair. What about the Oklahoma City Thunder? You know, when, you know, Shea Gilgis Alexander's getting paid and Lou Dort's getting paid and Chet Holmgren's getting paid. Like who, okay, Jalen Williams, it's your turn. Are we going to pay you? If we do, we have to pay this damn luxury tax. It's not fair. I don't. I, I understand the original reason why it was conceived, but it has backfired in the sense that all it's really done is punish competence. And I understand the pursuit of parity, but punishing competence is not the way to accomplish that. All right, moving on to the Warriors. So they blew a 13-point fourth quarter lead to lose to the Nets, 120 to 116. Kyrie was magnificent again, uh, 38 points on 22 shots, nine assists with just one turnover, countless big plays. Since KD went down, Kyrie is averaging 12.4 points per game in fourth quarters during this five-game stretch. And really, it's this simple. He's making pull-up jump shots over the top of the defense, and he's making kickout passes to good shooters. 
What have I always said about half-court situations when teams really slow the game down, trap you in the half-court, they load up on one side, you have to beat them either by shooting over the top or by kicking to shooters who can make you pay. And Kyrie's always been one of the best guys in the league to do that. Now, a lot of people are negative about Kyrie as it pertains to him being a number one. And for the record, I don't think Kyrie Irving as a number one is going to get you uh, to any sort of you know, uh, great heights or a championship. But he's a damn good number two, and he's doing a really nice job of filling in for a number one over the last couple of weeks. I understand all the baggage that comes with him, but there's a reason why when the Lakers were in discussions to get Kyrie this summer that I said it was worth it. There's a reason why I thought that there'd be some team out there like the Miami Heat or somebody who would make a move for Kyrie Irving even when everyone said it's not worth it. It's because his elite top-end talent still represents a skill set that very few players in this league can do. And he's reminding everybody of that over the course of this last couple of weeks. Nick Claxton, last three games, 21 points per game, 10 rebounds per game, 3.3 blocks per game, including the Nets being plus 59 in his shifts in three games. That's basically, they went two and one, and it's basically been like three blowouts in Nick Claxton's minutes. Um, he's running the floor super well. He's been hunting transition opportunities. He has 17 points in transition over the last two games. He's your prototypical modern center. He defends the hell out of the rim. He can hold his own on switches. He runs the floor super well. And he provides enough offensively as a vertical spacer and as an offensive rebounder and running the rim in transition that he's a huge positive. And he's going to end up signing a huge extension next season if things stay this way. Um, moving on to the Warriors a little bit, Steph and Andrew Wiggins were both really bad again. They combined to go nine for 25 from the field. They're both clearly still out of rhythm. And that's why I'm still not out on the Warriors. It really is this simple. What do they look like when they're at their best? It's Steph playing like an MVP, which he hasn't been as of late. Andrew Wiggins is the second best player on the team, you know, creates his own shot every once in a while, attacks closeouts well, he usually ends around 18, 19 points per game. They're not getting that from him right now. Their lights out defensively when they're at their best, and they stagger their bench with their starters to help the young guys. They've done all four of those things at various points in the season. Before Steph got hurt, he was playing like an MVP. Before Andrew Wiggins got hurt, he was playing some of the best basketball of his career. They've demonstrated that they can defend at a high level even without Andrew Wiggins. They did that during the stretch that Steph was injured. They rebuilt that urgency that was lacking earlier in the season. But now you're having to plug Steph and Andrew Wiggins back in, and both of them aren't in game shape and aren't in rhythm. What did I tell you guys earlier in the season when LeBron was struggling and he kept getting hurt? I said, because he had like a groin tweak, he had some other things. I was like, he needs like 15 games. And once he gets to 15 games, like you'll see things click for him. And what happened? He stayed healthy long enough to get into a rhythm. Things clicked. Now LeBron looks like an MVP again. That's what I'm waiting on for Steph. Now, if we get to the point where Steph is playing like an MVP and Andrew Wiggins is playing the way that we're accustomed to and Draymond's doing what he's doing and all these guys are playing and they're still losing, then I'll start to be seriously concerned. But like, I know it's frustrating, especially for Warriors fans, because you're like, man, we are over halfway through the season and we are still having these types of heartbreaking, gut-wrenching losses. I get it. But... The reasons this time around is your best player, who's become one of the most reliable players in the NBA over the last few years, is not playing well because he just came back from injury. And no, I don't think he lost a step. He literally had a shoulder injury. It's just you can't replicate basketball shape. It takes time to get back into basketball shape. Steph's working through it. Andrew's working through it. If, they get, if we get to a point five, 10 games from now where Steph is putting up 35 a night and they're still losing – then we can have another conversation about the Warriors, but I'm just not there yet. I do, of course, I still think they need to make a trade at the deadline, but I feel that way about most of the teams in the league because it's too even at the top. Someone needs to separate themselves. Um, all right, let's move on to our second quick hitter, the Philadelphia 76ers, who went 5-0 and on their West Coast road trip. Come on, Dallas. Come up here. Come on up. Say hi. He's been bothering me during the entire show. This is my puppy, Dallas, one of my Aussies. We have three dogs. Um, he's the sweet, super obedient one. Um, uh, getting a little old though. Makes you sad. If you ever have a dog, when they start to get old, it gets a little sad. All right. You got to get down now. Okay. <laughs> All right. So they beat some good teams on this road trip. They, uh, beat the Clippers. They beat the Lakers. They beat the Kings. They beat the Jazz. These are not easy games, especially on the road. Winning in Utah, not easy. Winning in Sacramento, not easy. That Lakers team has been really good for a while and they gave them a tough fight that night. 
Um, the Clippers, obviously not easy. Uh, they're just healthy and rolling, which is what I expected coming into the new year. If you guys remember my New Year's predictions, one of my big ones was the Sixers are going to get healthy and they're going to start ripping off wins. And if there was a time for them to drop some games, it'd be on this West Coast road trip, and they simply have not done so. Joel Embiid has been amazing, 35 points per game on 54% from the field and 44% from three during the road trip. Tyrese Maxey, 20, 21 points per game. You know, the Sixers are, again, the big question marks. It's kind of like with the Celtics where I need to see it to believe it in the late round of the playoffs. But like everything with the Sixers, it's like, is Joel Embiid and, and James Harden going to play like they do during the regular season when they get to the postseason? And those are legitimate question marks. And we may never get to see that until we get to the postseason. But in terms of talent and what this team is capable of in the half court on both ends of the floor, that they look like a bona fide championship contender. It's really just those playoff question marks that we have. All right, before we get out of here, the Lakers and the Blazers. I had a feeling the Lakers would win this game. Portland's been really bad uh, for a while now. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, Portland has an awful defensive backcourt and a center that can't protect the rim, which is just a recipe for disaster against a rim-pressuring team like the Lakers who have guards that can beat people off the dribble. Uh, LeBron has always had his way with Jeremy Grant. That's a matchup he's always played well in. Uh, and then Nurkic is quickly becoming one of the worst defensive players in the league right now. Uh, that's a whole other problem. We'll get to that in a little bit. But Portland was still up 25 at the half. Uh, Patrick Beverly was talking a bunch of shit to Dame Lillard. Dame Lillard was going off. Uh, but then the Lakers just methodically worked their way back, getting stops and hunting those transition opportunities like we talk about that are so important. I just want to talk about LeBron for a minute because he in particular has been hunting transition opportunities at an absurd rate in the last month. I wanted to give you guys some um, numbers to demonstrate that. But he's like trying to avoid that static half-court environment as much as possible because when LeBron gets in the half-court, because of the limited spot-up shooting talent that the Lakers have, they are really loading up the paint on him. And it's just hard for him to find quality shots in the half-court. So the more he hunts those transition opportunities, the more he can avoid the multiple help defenders. Um, in his last 10 games, LeBron is averaging 11.4 points per game just in transition. And he's actually, I know this is going to sound crazy to you guys, but he's actually starting to build a fringe MVP case. Now he has no chance to win the award. The Lakers are too far back in the standings and LeBron's missed a handful too many games. But I do think he'll get some votes and I wouldn't be surprised if LeBron finished seventh or eighth in MVP voting. And a big part of that is once again, last night, the Lakers were plus 17 with him and minus eight without him. That's been a recurring theme all season, or at least in this last chunk of the season. Since returning from the groin injury, LeBron is averaging 32 points, 8 rebounds, 7 assists, 61% true shooting, despite the fact that he's incapable of getting his 3-point shot going. And they are plus 162 when LeBron is on the floor, minus 145 when he's off the floor. They are 11-9 since AD went down in the Nuggets game. That, that type of production with that type of on-off value, with that type of supporting cast, that's MVP stuff. I don't know. I don't have any other way to put it. And when you combine that with the Lakers finally making a trade to address their perimeter size, again, if you want to hear about Rui Hachimura, go to our YouTube feed earlier. We did 20 minutes just on Rui, so I'm not going to get into that right now. But they finally made a trade. You add Anthony Davis to this, who was playing like an MVP before his injury. There's a lot to get excited about. They do need to make one more trade for a professional shooter. But when they do, the Lakers will be in business. You know who's not in business? The Portland Trail Blazers. <laughs> they are... Uh, they've won just 11 of their last 32 games. They have the fifth worst record in the league over that span. Only the Hornets, Pistons, Spurs, and Rockets have been worse than the Blazers since November 17th. Uh, Damian Lillard, Anthony Simons, and Jeremy Grant have played together for 1,532 possessions this year. That's a huge sample. And they have a net rating of plus two. So their best lineup is barely outscoring teams. Now, to be clear, I think they should blow it up. I think fundamentally... You can't have a backcourt with two guards that don't defend. It's just that simple to me. You've heard me say that about other teams around the league as well. But if you do want to try to salvage this thing, the center spot is where you got to start. You got to start with Nurkic. They need to get a real rim protector in there. Nurkic cannot move his feet, struggles to guard in space, doesn't have this, the, the, enough size and athleticism to really protect the rim. And that's a big part of why they're 21st in defense this year. There are a couple guys that I had in mind to keep an eye on. If the Wizards are trying to blow things up, and now I know he's got an ankle injury right now, but I'd try to target Chris Apps Porzingis. Another guy would be trying to call on is Miles Turner if he's not getting the extension that he wants from Indiana. But they, if, if you need to try to make it work with this group, 
you need to do something to shore up your rim protection. In theory, I like the idea of Dame, Anthony with like Gary Payton the second, with like Jeremy Grant at the four, with a guy like Miles Turner. Now, now we're talking about a team that's going to give Dame enough support to where maybe his top end talent can carry you over the top. But right now, they're just they're just not good enough in the front court to have the type of defense or defensive talent that they have in the back court with Dame and Anthony. It's something they have to address. All right, guys, that is all I have for today. As always, I appreciate your support. We will have uh, no show tomorrow. Tomorrow night, I am covering all the games, but it's not going to be on the feed until Wednesday morning. So keep an eye on the feed Wednesday morning for a breakdown of Tuesday night's games. And then I go out of town to Lake Tahoe, but we have another video coming out on Jokic in his MVP case as well. So keep an eye on the feeds for that. As always, I appreciate you guys, and I will see you in a couple of days.